Father, as we have just sung, we pray that you will not only hear us, but speak to us. That even the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. That we would see and hear. Through Christ Jesus, we ask this. Amen. <clears throat> when we moved here more than 26 years ago, we decided that the best option for us at that time was to build a house. So when we came in the middle of March, we didn't have a permanent place to live. Through those next six months, there was a lot of waiting and a lot of uh, moving around. We lived in the homes of people who were overseas. We lived in the homes of people who were on vacation. We lived in the homes of people while they were there. We might have lived in your house and you didn't even know it. We were just around. <laughs> who is that? I don't know, but they're here. But that, all of that was just, it was just waiting, waiting, waiting. And every day we'd go up to the construction site hoping for new things to happen, hoping for changes to come. And it was slow. But as hard as that was to wait and as long as six months felt, it was nothing compared to what the Israelites go through waiting for the temple to be built. The temples, the idea of the temple first comes to David when he is king. And he says, God, I want to build you a temple. And the Lord says, that's great, but no. You're not the guy to do that. Your son is the one to build the temple. And so the people wait and David accumulates all the materials, and it's all sitting there, and everyone's thinking, let's go. And he's like, nope, not yet. And Solomon becomes king, and the construction starts. And year after year after year, they wait and wait. And I suspect they all walk by thinking, look, see what's happening. Until finally the day comes, and it's finished. You can imagine the celebration. I mean, I was thinking about when we finally moved into our house and how great it felt to be settled. Even more so, the Israelites to come to this magnificent structure and feel like it's completed. It is great. And as we come to the beginning of 1 Kings 8, that's exactly what has happened. The temple has been completed. And it, it, all, the, all the utensils, all the parts of it are in place, and they're ready for it to be used. But before they use it, Solomon says, I think we need to pray. And he steps forward and he offers this prayer. It's a lengthy prayer. We just read parts of it. It's a long prayer that Solomon prays here. And what's interesting to me is that as Solomon prays this prayer, you get the feeling that the purpose of this temple is prayer. We kind of feel like maybe the purpose of the temple is sacrifice. The purpose of the temple is worship. The purpose of the temple is to come bring their gifts. And yes, all those things are a part of it. But Solomon doesn't really pray about those things. What he, the interesting thing, he prays a prayer about coming to the temple to pray. And he says, Lord, this is a place that's going to, this is a place of prayer for your people. Jesus reiterates that in the Gospels when he says to them, this is my father's house and my father's house is a place of prayer. That's the central thing because there is a way in which worship and giving and sacrifice is all a form of praying. Of the ways in which we connect to God. But what's interesting to me is that when Solomon prays this prayer about the temple being a place of prayer, it's not so much in the personal sense as it is in the corporate sense. Most of the language of this prayer is second person plural or first person plural. We, us. It's, it's not I. There's a little bit of I, but most of it is about us. It's about all the ways in which we as your people are going to come together and this temple is going to be a place for us corporately to pray. 
And you know, as much as we think prayer is a personal thing between us and God, and it is, it is also a corporate practice. There is something about praying together, whether that prayer looks like singing, whether that prayer looks like engaging in the scriptures, whether that prayer looks like actually saying words of prayer, all of these things that are the heart of praying, there is a way in which bringing, coming together to do that bonds us together. That when we pray with each other, when we pray for each other, we bond ourselves together with each other. And I think that's what Solomon is saying here is that this is going to be a place that's going to connect us as a community of believers, as your people. It's always been our desire about the prayer room, that that space would be a place that even if people come individually to that room to pray, that it would feel like it's connecting us together because we know when we walk into that room, people have been there before us and people are coming after us and our prayers get mingled with all of their prayers. And we see evidences of that when you look at the whiteboard and the things that have writ- people have written down and you see the various other ways in which people have engaged in prayer in that room and in that space. And we enter into that and there's a bond, there's a connection that takes place when we do that, when God's people pray. It helps us create community. We become the people of God in a way that you just can't do without prayer. And we need that kind of praying because we all have struggles. We all have burdens, individually and corporately. Solomon begins pointing those things out in this prayer. There are, there are times where he says, Lord, if we sin, hear our prayers. Lord, if there are disasters that come upon us, hear our prayers. All of these different things that the struggles of life that come to them, hear our prayers. I think at the heart of what he's praying is probably sin. And he says in verse 46, Lord, if we sin, well, let me retract that. When we sin, because everybody wrestles with sin. He's not saying, Lord, we're gonna, this temple is going to to be a place where where we don't wrestle with sin. This is the place we come when we wrestle with sin. And you know, an interesting thing about that is that there's something about our, our human nature that when we sin, the first place we turn is typically not toward God, but it's away from God. We learned that from our first parents. You see it in Genesis, right? Adam and Eve reject God, they disobey God, they run, they, they turn from God, and what's the first thing they do? It's not, Lord, we blew it. They run and hide. And they run and hide because they are certain that what, because they feel guilt and they feel shame and they feel this separation between them and God that they hadn't experienced before. And they run and hide because they're pretty sure that God is going to be vindictive toward them because that's what guilt and shame makes us feel. That's what the evil one continually wants to tell us. And Solomon says, no, no, no. We want our first reaction to sin is not turning away from God, but turning to God because where else are we going to find any help? Where else are we going to, to find hope and life? except in you, Lord. And so he says, and and it's not, we're not coming to you because we're perfect. We're coming to you because we need you. We're coming to you because you are the only answer we have. And this place is the place where we can individually and corporately come together and say, Lord, we need you. We don't deserve it, but we need you. And we're counting on you. And so he talks often about all these various sins and struggles that they're working with. And you know, I find it interesting too that he says, when, he doesn't say when we sin, don't punish us. Don't let us face the consequences of it. He does say when we sin and we face the consequences of it, help us. Restore us. Hear us. That's really the heart 
of the praying here is hear us. Over and over again, he says, hear us from heaven, just like we sang, hear us from heaven, hear us from heaven, hear us from heaven. There is a way in which you could interpret hear us from heaven to almost mean, God, would you wake up and pay attention to us? I mean, you know, if we have to say, Lord, hear us, hear us, hear us, hear us, there is a way in which the evil one is saying that, it, that you could interpret that as God isn't paying attention and we've got to get his attention. I'm pretty sure that's not what Solomon means. I was reading recently in uh, Kenneth Bailey's excellent book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. If you haven't, that was a book I'd encourage you to read. Kenneth Bailey taught in the Middle East in theological education for most of his adult life, and he knows the Middle East and the mind of the Middle Eastern people, and it it lends great insight into a lot of things about Scripture. But he talks about how uh, there were times where he and some colleagues would take treks into the Sahara Desert to do some research, going to some places in there. And they always used the same guy, a man they called Uncle Zaki, And he said, Uncle Zaki, he said, he didn't walk across the sand. He sort of floated across the sand. He just just had this way of almost, it felt, you looked at him, it almost felt like he was running and his feet hardly touched the ground. He just had such a a, a connection to the desert. He said he knew the desert like the back of his hand. And and he was this gentle, humble man. We We loved having him as our guide. But he said, just as we were about to leave the Nile region and to step into the desert, he said, every one of us had this sort of feeling in our minds that we wanted to say to him, Uncle Zaki, don't get us lost. He said, by that, we we didn't, we meant, Uncle Zaki, we're counting on you. We need you. Because once we get out in the desert, we don't have a clue where we are or where to go. It's just sand. We're counting on you. And he said, what we didn't mean was, Uncle Zaki, we're not sure you're not, that you know what you're doing. And we, we have to remind you not to get us lost because otherwise you might well get us lost. He said, if we believed that, we wouldn't take one foot onto that sand of the Sahara Desert. And he said, the point of us thinking that was not for his sake, it was for our sake. It's not that we had to remind him not to get us lost. It was a matter of us reminding ourselves that we can trust him and he won't. And when Solomon says, hear us from heaven, he's not saying, Lord, wake up and pay attention to us. It's for them, it's for those who are praying to remind them, God hears us. And we can trust him. And we're counting on you. And the interesting thing about hearing in the scriptures, it always means action. When you read in the book of Exodus, it says God heard the cries of his people in, in, in Egyptian bondage. And, he, and it says he heard their cries and a bush in the desert caught fire. And a man, a shepherd named Moses, walked over to it, and God said to him, go get my people. And Solomon prays and says, Lord, hear us and forgive. Hear us and restore us. Hear us and return us. Hear us and help us. We we sort of understand that idea. I was thinking back to when I was a I was a child, and I'd be playing with something, all engrossed in it, and my mother would say, Wes, I want you to take out the garbage. And I heard her, but I didn't do anything. I just kept playing. And you know, the, almost always the first thing, next thing she would say to me was, did you hear me? And, and the, the interesting thing is, I'm sitting right there. She knows I heard her. But she made the direct connection that if I didn't get up and do what she asked me to do, I didn't hear her. Always action. 
We can talk about hearing all the time, but if we don't do anything, how will be really heard? And God says, I'm a God who is about action. We worship a God who is active. He may not do everything we want him to do, but he's always working, always hearing. We can count on him. We can trust him. He is always at work. And he is a God who has the power and the ability to do above and beyond what we could imagine. He is a God who can not only hear our prayers, but he can do something about it. I want to worship a God like that. When you look at how the temple is designed, it feels like it's designed for for exclusivity. There are different, a series of courts or areas in the temple. And the outer court was a place where only, that's as far as Gentiles could go. The next court was as far as Jewish women could go. And the next court was as far as Jewish men could go who weren't Levites. And the next court was as far as Levites could go who weren't from the the, uh, tribe of Aaron who were priests. And the next court was as far as those priests could go if they weren't the high priest. And the inner court, the very inner, inner central place was the holy place and only the high priest could go in there and he could only go once a year. And when you look at that, it feels like there is this this design of excluding people. But I don't think that's the point of it. I think one point of it is that it's a reminder that the closer you get to that most holy place where God is, it's a reminder to them that the God who dwells there, and he says, I'm going to dwell there. His holiest glory fills that place. And he says, I'm a holy God, and that should matter to you. I'm a God who's other than you. I'm a God that that wants relationship with you, but I'm also a God who's other than you. And I want a God who's other than me. It's like parents and children. You know, we want to be close to our children, but the worst thing we can do for our little children is to make them think that they're equal with us. Because that means they get to make their own decisions about things they have no business making decisions about. They don't, know, they don't know how to make those kinds of decisions. They need adults. They need parents to say to them, no, that's a bad thing. That will hurt you. Don't do that. This is what you need to eat. I know it's not your favorite, but it's good for you, and it'll help you. These are things you do. These are things you don't do. As children, we all need that. And God is saying to us, his people, you're my children, And that means there are ways that are higher than your ways and you need to know that I am greater than you and that ought to be a good thing for you. So how are you going to get rescued if I'm not greater than you? How are you going to be forgiven if I'm not greater than you? How are you going to be set free from the bondage of your sins if I'm not greater than you? If I'm not the God who is holy that you worship, how can you ever have anything more than just what you can do yourself if I'm not that God? And the temple is designed to remind them that this is the God we worship and he is awesome and we can rely on him. And when we come to him and say, Lord, hear us from heaven, he does and he acts in a way that we cannot imagine. That's the God we worship. But there is also a sense of the temple that it's not excluding, it's actually welcoming. Because in many, if it were just designed by anybody who wanted to design a place and many of the other ways in which people, other nations that people worship, there's no place for women. There's no place for anybody who's not a priest. Only the priests get to worship. And even the men are excluded, and certainly the women, and certainly anybody who's from another nation. There's no place for them. And God says, I have designed my place of worship. I designed the place where we come together and have community as the place where everybody is welcome and everyone can worship. I think that's why Jesus, at least one of the reasons why Jesus gets so upset and cleanses the temple. Part of it's because the temple authorities are 
are using the system to, to bilk the people out of as much money as they can get. But it's also because this whole thing that's going on, this bazaar, this circus, is taking place in the court of the Gentiles. The only place where Gentiles can come and worship with others, the, the great holy God, Yahweh, is filled with animals and people bartering and money changing hands. It is a circus there. How in the world do you pray in a place like that? And Jesus shoves it all aside and says, that's not what my father's house is about. And you know, they should have known that. They should have known that God welcomes all people who want to seek him. All people who are interested in him. He should have known that because Solomon prays about it in this prayer when the temple is dedicated. It's one of the most astounding things about this whole prayer. Is in the middle of Solomon praying, Lord, your people, your people, your people, your people. He says, oh yeah, and don't forget the foreigners. Don't forget those from the other nations. He beginning in verse 41 says, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may know that this house I built bears your name. He is in essence saying those nations that are, that are a, a burr in our saddle, if they come to you, hear their prayer. Those nations that have enslaved us, if they turn and come to you, hear their prayer. Those people who are persecuting us, if they hear about you and they come to you, hear their prayer. Let's be honest, sometimes we don't want God to hear the prayers of our enemies. Sometimes we don't want God to hear the prayers of the people who are mistreating us. But the purpose of the temple is that anyone, anyone who hears of God and is, seek, and is seeking Him is welcome, and God will hear the prayers. And my question is, how do they hear about God? There's only one way they hear about God. It's from Israel. There is something about the way Israel lives out their prayers that is intended to be a witness to the nations around them, near and far. That because Israel gives a, presents a witness of the nature of God, the greatness of God, the love of God, the, the compassion of God, the forgiveness of God, Israel lives that prayer so clearly to the people around them that those people watching Israel say, they have something we want. What is it? Can we come worship Yahweh too? And there is something about our prayers that create new hearts in us and new ways of helping people see Jesus, which is the ultimate end of our praying. It's not, just, it's not just that Jesus would do something in us. It's that Jesus would do something in me so that he does something in all of us together so that he does something through us to other people who need to hear. I read recently a story about a man named John Church who was, he was driving, he was, a, he was an evangelist back in the early part of the 20th century and he was driving to an appointment. This was back in, during the Second World War. And he was driving to get to an appointment and he had to take a ferry across a, a body of water. And so he realized he was really cutting it close, so he was going. And he, as he was going, he saw a GI walking along the road. And in, in, during World War II, he saw a GI walking on the road, he picked him up. So he stopped, picked the man up, and took off again. They were both going to th getting to the same place. And so he's going along, trying to get there as fast as he can. And he, has, he, he hears in his mind the Lord say to him, stop the car. He's thinking, I can't stop the car. I'm going to be late. If I'm going to miss the ferry if I stop the car. And so he keeps going. Here's again, stop the car. And he's wrestling with God. And a third time, stop the car. And he says, okay. And he pulls over to the side of the road. And as soon as he pulls off, one of the tires on his car blows out. 
gets out of the car, goes back to the trunk, takes out the stuff, starts changing the tire. That GI is just sitting there in the front seat. Finally, he gets out of the car, comes around, and he says to John Church, did you know that tire was going to blow? He said, no. Well, then, why'd you stop? He said, well, I felt like God was prompting me to stop the car. And that gee, I kind of shook his head, and he said, man, I'm not a Christian but I'd give anything in the world for connection like that. There is a power in our prayers that's beyond us. I'm interested in the fact that Solomon keeps saying, when your people pray toward the temple, when your people pray toward the temple, You get the sense that he's almost saying there is something magical about facing the temple. Almost like, you know, if you face the temple, you get better reception with God. You know, it makes me think about when I was younger and the only television was through the airwaves, a lot of people had antennas on their houses. I remember we had some friends who lived out in the country. I guess kind of like we live out in the country. And long ways from any cities, but they lived in southern Indiana. They were sort of between Indianapolis and Louisville, and they could pick up different stations. They had a great big antenna, and they had a device on their television that was programmed. And when they turned it to a certain spot, the antenna moved so that it got the best reception, whether it was going to Louisville or going to Indianapolis or Terre Haute or somebody else, someplace else. And that, that thing, the antenna, moved to get the best reception. And there's something in the back of our minds that might think, well, you pray toward the temple and you get better reception with God. I don't think that's what he means. There's not something magic about that. But I do think there is something important in thinking about that. Because when he, when he gives them this prayer... He's, this is not just a theoretical prayer. This is not like one of those places, times when you sit in a class, think to yourself, when am I ever going to use this in my life? I don't think that's what Solomon is. Solomon's not saying, look, Lord, we're probably never going to need to pray these things, but just in case, let's cover our bases. I think instead of saying, if your people do these things and go through these things, he'd probably more likely to say, when your people do these things and go through these things. And when you get to, to Daniel, hundreds of years later, Daniel, who knows this prayer, is standing at a window in Babylon. Israel is in exile. And it says to us that he faced Jerusalem and he prayed. And when Daniel does that, he's not looking for magic. He's not looking for better reception from God. What he's doing is saying, God, you said your glory filled that place. That place for your people represents you and everything you are. The temple is the place where God dwells here on earth. And, when I, and I'm praying toward Jerusalem as an act of faith and hope in your promises. And my prayers are not just me praying out there. My prayers are directed directly to you. You made a promise and we're counting on it. What a phenomenal thing for us to ponder as we think about our prayers. All of our prayers are rooted in the nature of God. That he's good and merciful and compassionate that he hears us and that he acts that we can trust him and sometimes we just need to be reminded of that because we live in a world that is continually turning us away from that 
I think maybe that's what Walter Brueggemann means when he talks about this prayer. And he says, it is a way for Israel in their struggles to sort of reposition their lives once again toward God. Maybe that's one of the great purposes of us coming together every week and entering into a spirit of prayer through songs and through worship, through scriptures, through praying, through all the things that we do to reposition our lives to be focused on Jesus. I think doing that will not only change our lives, it will change our lives. And not just when we're here, but maybe more when we're not here. Holy Father, thank you for the promise of your relationship with us, the promise of who you are to your people all over the world, including this place. Help us to believe it, to see it, to engage in it, and to find you true and faithful trustworthy through the grace of Christ Jesus. Amen.